Today, we're blessed with a first-hand account of the Shroud of Turn Research Project in 1978, plus a lot more. Stick around. I'll be right back. Greetings, Gracious Gang. It's Mike Creevy from thegraciousguest.org here with you for another episode of The Gracious Guest Show. If you're unfamiliar with this show, this is where we kind of look at all things faith and culture. We try to ultimately live with wonder and awe by pushing back against some of the more relativistic and kind of reductionist trends that are kind of inundating us each and every day in so many ways, getting us to sort of lose sight of of what we really are, what we're really called to, what our relationship with with God really is and is meant to be. And in order to do that, we kind of look at all kinds of things around here, from literature to movies. We have conversations. We have interviews. There's all kinds of content that uh, I think will really benefit you. So if you haven't subscribed to this channel already, please do that. Please uh, click that little thumbs up down there and share this interview, I would ask, in a particular way with uh, anyone you think might benefit from this. I really appreciate that. Today, I'm delighted that we have uh, two guests on here today, Dr. Kenneth E. Stevenson and Dr. Brian Donley Worrell. Dr. Stevenson was the official recorder for the 1978 Shroud of Turin Research Project, where uh, several dozen scientists, largely from uh, this, this country, were able to go over to Turin uh, and to investigate the Shroud. They got special access and they got uh, a series of a couple days there to really do a tremendous amount of hyper sophisticated scientific inquiry into the shroud. Uh, it's often said that the shroud of Turin is the most studied and and sort of researched artifact in the history of the world, and a lot of it goes back to what Sturp did in 1978. So this is my first opportunity to speak with someone from the original team, which was just a tremendous honor. Just by way of some biographical background on my two guests here today, Dr. Kenneth E. Stevenson was an Air Force Academy graduate and then served with distinction in the Vietnam War with the Strategic Air Command as a B-52 co-pilot. Uh, he volunteered for combat duty in Southeast Asia and amassed over 1,200 combat flying hours and 210 combat missions. He received 10 air medals and three distinguished flying crosses for his service, also advanced to command his own B-52 crew at the age of 25 and was one of the youngest commanders in Strategic Air Command. Uh, he then returned to be a professor at his alma mater of the United States Air Force Academy, which is where he met Dr. John Jackson, Dr. Eric Jumper, and, and this uh, carpool that he discusses here began uh, and, and uh, really led to the Shroud of Turn research project. So we're going to get more into that later. Um, Dr. Stevenson lectures far and wide. Uh, he holds uh, degrees also in uh, theology. Uh, he is a pastor. Uh, and if for me to just share his biography with you would probably take most of this time <laughs> because he's a, a truly remarkable man. And uh, he has tirelessly been uh, teaching and uh, uh, writing about the Shroud. He has written many, many books about the Shroud. I've got a bunch of links below you're going to want to check out. Um, but, and then we also have Dr. Brian Donley Worrell, who works with Dr. Stevenson very closely on all things Shroud. Uh, he is a former Fortune 500 vice president with a strong background in chemistry, internet technology, business development, and blockchain technology. His multilingual skills served as an important tool for his work in international business development and program management. With a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry, much of his postgraduate work focused on the disparate areas of various technologies and biblical sciences, culminating with his PhD in biblical studies. So I'm delighted to have Dr. Stevenson and Dr. Worrell with us here today. I think you're really going to love this interview. And just before anybody comments on this, I just want to mention this up front and sort of sing the praises of Dr. Worrell here, because um, I, I had all these plans to try to split things up and even things out as much. And, and Dr. Worrell was very kind and so humble in his emails with, with me. He's such a uh, tremendously respectful man and is so uh, delighted to work alongside Dr. Stevenson, who himself was, of course, on the original Shroud of Turn Research Project, that Dr. Worrell was insistent that 
He said, you really want to talk to Dr. Stevenson. You really want to, you know, sort of uh, uh, do the best you can to exhaust your time with him because of all of his experience with the Shroud. So I don't want anyone to think I was shortcutting Dr. Worrell at all. He was he was very insistent that I, <laughs> that I, I, I take advantage of this opportunity. So I do have a, a, a several parts in the interview where I, I ask him for his input and like to get his take on some things as well, for sure. So uh, but I just wanted to mention that and, and mention he is. Uh, truly a, a humble man. So I want to thank both Dr. Stevenson and Worrell for being with us today. So let's jump right into this interview on the Shroud of Turin Research Project and all things Shroud with Dr. Kenneth E. Stevenson and Dr. Brian Donley Worrell. Enjoy. So Dr. Kenneth Stevenson and Dr. Brian Donley Worrell, thank you so much for coming on the Gracious Guest Show. Thank it's you. really great to be here. Thanks for having us. And this is this is exciting because we, you know, I... I as this often happens, just um, being anyhow connected to the uh, Shroud community, you know, you'll, you'll talk to someone, they'll say, oh, you should talk to so-and-so, you should talk to so-and-so. And, and so I don't remember exactly you know, who it was who, who uh, initially connected me. I think it was my friends down there in um, uh, in Texas, Dr. Stevenson, specifically uh, yes. over at the uh, the Pilgrim Center for, for Hope up there oh, in yes. San Angela. And, the, and, yes. uh, yep, and Nan, they're doing that um, – uh, exhibit there. And so, uh, but I'm, I'm delighted to have you both on here. And I, I just wanted to uh, ask you, you know, how, whatever order you want to go in here, just to sh maybe share with the audience a little bit about your own background and, and especially how the shroud uh, entered into Came your in. life. Well, yeah. I'll start. Um, basically, I first saw the shroud uh, at a Catholic discussion group or retreat uh, many years ago. It was an item of interest, but I never for a moment uh, dreamed I'd be involved. Um, I was at the Air Force Academy at the time. Um, following my duty in Vietnam, I was assigned uh, for a master's to go back to the academy and teach, where I ended up in a carpool with a physicist, an electrical engineer, and an aeronautical engineer. And we had an interesting discussion one day about faith and the electrical engineer was very adamant that he was an agnostic and that if God gave him such a scientific brain, God would surely reveal himself through science. At which point the physicist mentioned the shroud. And both the aeronautical engineer and I had heard of it. Of course, we chimed right in. And he said, well, has it ever been studied? The answer, of course, was no. And he said, well, if it was ever studied or and, and proven or tested and shown to be accurate, then maybe I would believe. Um, since you've read Nazar, you have seen what he has to say now. His name is D. German, and he's in the front of Nazar. Um, <laughs> from those four guys in that carpool was birthed the Shroud of Trend Research Project. Um, my background with the master's in English and my undergraduate degree in engineering, I was uh, perfectly suited to be their editor and their spokesperson and their recording secretary. And that's how I got involved, literally. Um, I reached a point in my Air Force career where, uh, although I was at the top of my career in every respect, um, I went in for a review and the review read like I was Superman and it was very nicely written. And then the officer who wrote the review said, now, if you want the rating that you have earned, you need to drop the shroud. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, why? <laughs> You're getting great press. <clears throat> look at my reviews. Look what I'm publishing. Yeah. On and on and on. And he said, the shroud is hokey. That's a quote. Mm. I don't know what became wow. of him. <laughs> I left the Air Force. I have never regretted it. Um, yeah. God has had his hand on my life ever since. Interestingly enough, I gave up flying at that time because, A, the airlines weren't hiring for the most part. And if they were, you couldn't afford to live on the wages that they were paying a starter pilot. So even though mm -hmm. I had massive experience, that was not in the cards. I joined IBM. And um, three years later, when I wrote Verdict on the Shroud, IBM came looking for me, said, we understand you're a pilot. How'd you like to come fly our jets? So I always say it was like God said, thank you for writing that book. Now go have some fun, fly some jets. <laughs> oh, that's good. And what year was that carpool, that, that initial conversation? The carpool happened? was in 1976. Um, okay. 
By early 77, the Shroud of Turin Research Project was pretty much uh, put together as a unit. Um, it basically was other scientists from NASA, Jet Propulsion Lab, Los Alamos, Sandia. Uh, we're talking not as some have presumed a religious group at all. Uh, right. It was different scientists. And they had a conference in New Mexico, which was called the 1977 Proceedings of the U.S. Conference of Research on the Shroud of Turin, uh, which was my privilege to edit. And we took that and the three-dimensional uh, to Italy and got our foot in the door and rest, as they say, is history. Hmm. Very good. And uh, and we're going to talk a lot more about how that went <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as much as we can in this form. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, Dr. Worrell, how about, how about you? Well, I was, I would say, privileged to first hear of the Shroud when I was probably... I would say a, a young teenager, and it sounded very interesting to me. Um, I'm the type of person, and uh, Dr. Stevenson will probably laugh when I say this, I'm a little bit of a type A personality, just a little. <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm one of those people who, and I've, I've been this way since I was a child, I, I always want to find out, oh, that sounds good, but is this real? Am I just hearing mm -hmm. something like, Santa Claus or something else people make up. And right. so at that time, I really was not positioned to do a lot of in-depth study. And as Dr. Stevenson stated earlier, there really had been no in-depth analysis or study of the Shroud at that time. So I'd heard about it. I was lacking any level of detail or specificity about it. And I would say in later years, I would hear of it again. And you know, it's one of those things that you just hear about but there's really not a lot of data that you can really decide, oh, this is real, or, oh, here's another Loch Ness monster, so to speak. Right. So um, right. Uh, anyway, I, after college, I, my undergrad degree is in chemistry. Uh, I then went into the Fortune 500 and proceeded, quote unquote, up the ladder, so to speak, and started doing a lot of work internationally and decided to go back to school and finish up my doctorate in, uh, in biblical studies and theology. So while I was studying to, actually while I was writing my doctoral thesis, uh, a gentleman at our school said, hey, there's a, there's a fellow who is a, a doctorate and he's writing a book on his subject. And I wonder if you would take a look at the book and just really give me an overall overview, analysis, et cetera, of the book. And I agreed to do so. And that book actually was the fifth book or fourth book, correct me if I'm mistaken, yeah. Dr. Stevenson, mm -hmm. the fifth mm -hmm. book written by Dr. Stevenson himself. That book is entitled uh, Nazah, which I'm sure you have a copy of as well. Mm -hmm. And so I was privileged to read a pre-release version of that book and gave my comments on the book. I, I thought it was just, it was everything I had ever wanted in terms of the level of information and specificity and factual mm -hmm. information that I had always sought. I thought it was right. the best book I had ever read on the subject. And I wrote my remarks about the book. And interestingly enough, uh, my remarks were actually included on the very first page of that book. If you look in that book, you'll see Dr. <laughs> Brian Don oh, yep. on the first page. So uh, that's how I really came to it. And in reviewing that book, that's how I really got to know Dr. Stevenson. And we've been um, close both professionally and personally ever since. Oh, very good. Yeah. And this... Um... It really does sometimes strike me as, as kind of a, a family, right? Sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, it and it there, really you know, has become that. You know? yes. yeah. um, I, had, I just um, finished speaking in Houston with Barry Schwartz, our photographer, Rudy Dictal, one of our physicists. But while I was there, there were no fewer than two people that I've spoken to over the years who are now working on getting their own shroud exhibits. Uh, one in Alabama mm -hmm. and another person who wow. uh, fostered getting the shroud into the Bible, uh, Museum of the Bible. And it was there only temporarily, but then she moved it into a, I don't know the name of the building, but it's operated by the Catholic uh, diocese there. And this is someone I talked to years ago, never thinking the impact it would have. So it has become very much like a family. I could tell you stories of people that I've spoken to. There's a, a, a young man now who's making 
I, I, there's silver like amulets or something with the 3D of the shroud. Mm. Um, turn out his mother took him to a presentation that I gave as a young man. He grew up and became a silversmith and was so fascinated that he started creating no. these objects so that people could <laughs> see what he saw. I, it's like that. Yeah. That reminds me of the, the uh, friends of this of this show I've had on before. Um, the uh, the let your light shine, you know, three D um, uh, uh, night lights that uh, that Julie and Sheila that they came on to talk about that, and that's uh, we we have one here. And every time <laughs> I'm just washing my hands and see it, it's just such a that's because because we'll get into some of the details here, some of the really interesting. Um, I almost hate to use that word; it doesn't seem to do it justice. But some of the really uh, just jaw dropping, eye opening, truly yes. profound mysteries about the shroud. But by the same token, I think sometimes. Just the simple and and so profound reality of that face, you know, it gets me every time to just just look at that over face my shoulder. And, and, if you can see it, yeah. is the three D bust of the shroud. Mm. I have carried that with me as I've traveled. Invariably, people mm. immediately recognize it as Jesus, and they'll say, "That's wow. amazing! Where did you get it? How do you?" Well, it opens up the door for you to share. And they said, "But it's right. three dimensional." Yes. That happens to be one of the most exciting characteristics of the shroud image. The image on the surface fibers of those threads is encoded in such a fashion that it's literally possible to recreate the distance the body was from the cloth at any given point. Incredible. Wow. Incredible. Wow. And one of a kind, period. Wow. Well, what, let me ask you this, Dr. Stevens, as far as, you know, when, when you actually get on the ground over there, it's, um, uh, what's the time frame? Yet? Is, is, so 1978, um, yes. you want to just give us the, the kind of, when did you land? What was it like? I understand there were some, uh, some challenges to say the oh, least. Oh my goodness. Like well, let's start, through. let's start at getting there. <laughs> uh, we did a dry sure. run a few months before and I had proposed, um, to Doc then Harry John, who was the head of the Durant's corporation, uh, he was the one who eventually funded the the trip over. But we had multiple million dollars worth of space age technology. And we literally were waiting at the last minute to see if he was going to come through and pay for the trip. And that, that's an absolute truth. And what ended up happening, he, he paid. But just before we left, and I'm going to tell you a couple of stories to make a thread here. Just before we left, I get a call from Rolling Stone magazine. <laughs> and huh. the author of one of the best articles on the Shroud, Michael Thomas, is calling me to tell me, do I really need to go? I think, I don't know if I believe this. I think it's going to be a waste of time. Oh, is that? Oh, there it is. <laughs> there you go. And I said, <laughs> you come and you won't regret it. So there's a picture wow. of us at the airport in New York. And I'm telling everybody, I said, our picture is going to be on the cover of the Rolling Stones. So we got a big joke out of that. Then we get there and several things happened. Um, first of all, we had a press conference and all kinds of inquiry about what we were doing, whether or not we were a religious project. Well, guess whose job right. that was as the spokesman? That was mine. Um, mm. Michael Thomas ended up being an ally, not only an ally, he ended up babysitting our kids while we were there because several of us oh, brought our wow. children along. So here's oh, wow. what happened first. The Italian authorities had never seen equipment like this. Again, much of it a spinoff of space technology. Right. So they quarantined it. And we had a limited time to be there. And uh, the late father, Peter Rinaldi, who just happened to be a friend of the king, uh, of Italy, the exiled King Umberto II, um, Comes in who handy. owned the shroud. <laughs> um, the Italian authorities who guarded the shroud uh, connected to the church didn't care that the American scientists were there. Um, mm. But the king said, let them in. <laughs> and so um, they pulled up in this huge truck and um, you can see our wives uh, dictating which box goes where, and uh, there we were. Uh, we set up in the rooms that they used to house the visiting royalty from other royal families. And um, the saddest part of all, because we had to prove before going 
that we would in no way damage the shroud. We had to prove it. They subjected uh, linen to 10 times the amount of radiant energy we were going to use in our non-destructive testing to demonstrate we wouldn't harden it, harm it. They brought it to us thumbtacked down to a plywood board. You could literally see the rust stains on the linen from the thumbtacks. Ah, mm -hmm. the most disturbing thing of all. But then <laughs> six 24-hour days, just about, I think Barry says it's a little over five I always remembered it to be six for whatever reason. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it was around the clock, like a space shot. Uh, each test mm -hmm. depending on another test. We'd finish one test, the next test would be lined up. We did infrared, x-ray, every form of non-destructive testing that was known at that time. And we submitted it to more testing than any other archaeological artifact in the history of the world. Mm. And that's and you, so you just have a few days there to do that. But I think what a lot of people don't know is that it's it's you didn't have you know conclusive. I mean, you know, so you subjected to those tests to get all that data, and then you you continue. The team continues to then it study took us and, three and, and, go, and a half go down years. that path for years, right? Yeah, it took us three and a half years to analyze, collate, get peer review, because yeah. again, people have the misunderstanding. This is some kind of religious group. It wasn't. Most of the guys thought it was a fake and they figured, give us about five or 10 minutes and we'll figure out how this thing was created. And it turned out not to be so. So at the end of three and a half years with all the things that we did and the peer review and the sessions, I have a shoebox full of micro cassettes of all of the meetings that we had discussing what we learned in those six days. And mm -hmm. at the end of that three and a half year period of time, the conclusion was this is an authentic burial garment of a man who was crucified, crowned with thorns, pierced in the side. In short, a man whose death burial uh, exactly matches what the Gospels tell us of Jesus. But then they said, we have no idea how the image was formed. And unless future tests reveal that, it's going to remain a mystery. And that's that pretty much, I think, shook the world up. Right. Well, and, and what always strikes me too so much uh, is that it's – I try to get this across to my high school students who I, I typically kind of share a basic version of a lot of this with uh, each spring right before Easter. And um, the thing I was trying to get across to them that was really striking me recently was that it's it's not just that it matches everything – that that Christ goes through in his suffering and death. It's, it's, as far as we know from all of our historical records, he's the only one that this specific set of, of, of injuries were inflicted upon. And and I think the, we, some people miss that point sometimes too. It's it's incredible because there's no other recording of someone being crowned with thorns, pierced in the side. It was traditional to break the legs. His legs aren't broken. And what mm. I clearly state, and I, I make this clear when I give my presentation, if you don't believe the shroud is real, that's fine. But at the end of my presentation, you will definitely understand what it costs Christ to go to the cross in your place. And mm. what I generally conclude with is, okay, it's accurate historically. It's accurate anatomically. It's accurate medically. Mm. It's accurate scientifically. It's accurate scripturally. So if it's accurate in all those details, of his death and of his burial, is it possible that the image is there because it's accurate in his resurrection? Hmm. So is there, when, I correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm getting my years mixed up. If it was 82 or 83 that the, your final report was concluded uh, that, that you had October 81. Term, the, the, the finished product, 81, oh, 81. Okay, October okay. 81. And um, and verdict on right. the shroud came out uh, that month. Okay, that was my first book. And so, how how was the next? How did the next few years? How did you find those years in terms of? Because I've heard other folks sharing, you know, from afar. I haven't spoken with them personally, but how those next few years really went in terms of how well it was received in different presentations or just different folks that you were sharing that kind of cutting edge you discovery know, with it it really sparked a lot of debate about why there was no carbon dating test and okay. as we now know the carbon dating test that was done was not only hopelessly flawed but corrupt 
uh, corrupt to the core. Um, but what ended up happening is it finally took the shroud, in my opinion, out of obscurity and at least put it in front of everybody. Now, what muddied the waters is when they came down with this bogus dating and said, this is what triggered most of us. They said it was a fake. Hmm. Now, had they said it's medieval, but it is real, that would have been a different statement. Because remember, hmm. we had already concluded it was a genuine burial garment. No, they came out and said it was a fake without any offering of what scientific evidence convinced right. them that it was a fake. And so for most of us, it was we were, we were left scratching our heads. I remember uh, Ray Rogers, who uh, the late Ray Rogers, who was our chemist, and he said, I, I don't understand. I really can't comprehend. And before he died, he was one of the first to prove that the reason the date was slewed is they primarily dated cotton that had been woven in to the area of the fabric that they, they dated. But that dating so muddied the waters that to this day, I'll go and someone will say, yeah, didn't they prove that was a fake? No, they didn't prove it was a fake. Right. <clears throat> Quite the contrary. Well, and that strikes me as, you know, that had to, that had to feel, I don't want to say like a personal attack. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But, it, but for the way you were just saying it, that interests me, the idea of to just be so dismissive in, in yeah. the way that that whole press conference went, that to basically, and knowing full, in my opinion, for what it's worth, knowing full well how the whole media machine works, yes. you know, and how that's going to hit headlines. And that's going to be very, a very popular sort of uh, thing as, as it of course was. It, it, it strikes me as just shocking how, how much of an affront really in a lot of ways to all of your professional integrity that must have been too, <laughs> it, <laughs> to just it, so dismissively like right off, like everything you all did is just, well, pff, you know. Yeah, it's fake. And, that's, and that's, I'll take it a step further. <laughs> One of the things yeah. that, that really made it personal to me, very personal to me, um, I had uh, taught in some of my classes uh, the writings of uh, apologetist John, uh, Josh McDowell. And his book, Evidence That the Man's a Verdict, he quotes author Peter Stoner, estimating that if it would take one times 10 to the 17th power for any other person in history to fulfill the prophecies surrounding the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. And I wrote him and I said, are you aware that all of the ones that he cites are fulfilled on the shroud? <laughs> so he wanted to meet with me and he met with me. And instead of it becoming a, a meeting of two Christian brothers discussing the evidence for the resurrection, it became an interrogation session with him and two other guys interrogating me. Ask me how I know about mm. interrogation. I taught it at the Air Force Academy. But anyway, <laughs> uh, um, and he ended up really, he wrote a book and he just really lambasted me um, in mm. his book. He basically said that I was emotionally involved, which discredited any uh, effort of being objective or scientific. Um, but I was used to it by then. National mm. Geo did a great article. Every single word in that article came through me. But mm. if you read that article, my name isn't there. And when I said, mm. when I saw that, I, I called them up and said, hey, guys, my name isn't in the article. Why? I'll never forget what he said. You're a Christian. You can't be objective. <laughs> Excuse me? Um, <laughs> please explain to me how an agnostic or an atheist is objective. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it's, it's, there's a double standard out there for sure that we're up. Absolutely. Against, uh, you know, um, let me ask you, uh, Dr. Worrell, I want to ask you real quick here as far as, um, so you, you mentioned your, your interest, was your interest primarily through the chemistry lens? Cause you had mentioned that, you know, so I, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, as far as, is what really kind of drew you maybe to, to an interest in the shroud and kind of kind of the timeline here of that compared to like the, the shroud dating and, and some of those controversies? Yes, my interest initially was spurred, I'd say in a more general sense. Um, as I said, I'm okay. one of those people who I really like to 
find out if something is real. And, and if I'm going to determine whether or not it is real, I'm going to have to have facts. I'm going to have to have every bit of information I can. I relate all that information and say, you know, this actually adds up very well. And uh, I mentioned that uh, to piggyback on what Dr. Stevenson said, the I want to use the word flawed, but I really want to say corrupted. The corrupted, intentionally corrupted, in, in my humble opinion, carbon dating of the shroud, it really affects me as a scientist because I mentioned my undergrad degrees in chemistry. The first Fortune 500 job I had was working in the computer applications research lab of a Fortune 500 company. So I have quite a background mm. in science. Right. One of the first things you learn as a chemist is reproducibility. Everything that you do, you have to be able to reproduce it again later to be able to prove it is true. So when I read the accounts of how the dating was done and how it was set up, everything inside me just said, wait, wait, none of this is going to work. And sure mm -hmm. enough, it didn't. It gave you fake and false results. So uh, from that aspect, as a chemist and a scientist, I was, I was highly angered by it because as a scientist, you have the ability to have access to and to analyze information and data, which no one else has or can really interpret. Yes. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us right. to be truthful and honest in what we're seeing. We're not to take data and say, hmm, let's make it look another way, or let's take 10% of it and say X, Y, Z. In fact, if the data is going to show that this piece of linen is about 2,000 years old, let's find a way to get some data that can make it look like it's not 2,000 years old. And that's honestly what happened. Hmm. Well, and why was the, uh, I didn't you know, mention this in notes ahead of time to either of you here, but I'm, I'm just curious because I've, I don't remember the exact date, but I, my understanding is that the, the raw data wasn't made available. And I think then only by Freedom of Information Act kind of forcing the hand, if I remember correctly. But wasn't that just in the last, like, maybe six, seven years, something like that? I mean, Probably very even less than that. It's been the last few years. Okay. It was by force yeah. uh, of the Freedom of Information Act. And what was revealed is exactly what Dr. Brown was talking about, where they didn't even utilize all the data they collected. Um, if the data didn't match what they wanted to get, they slewed it out. And the fact of the matter mm -hmm. is there was an unofficial dating of the shroud. I'm aware of it. Um, many of the members of STERP were aware of it. The reason it was never brought forth was because there was no unbroken chain of custody. We didn't follow the standard scientific path that should have been followed. And so therefore it would have been criticized. But that unofficial mm. dating came out with 2,000 years. I'm not, I wasn't surprised at all. None of us were. Um, was that – did you – I think I read in, in one of your books. Was, was that – that was early, right? Was that – Yes. It was early on. One or two or something? Okay, yeah. Yeah, it was early on. Okay. Maybe even before that. I know that we oh. knew about it when we were still all talking together. And, well, and, and there's, unfortunately there's been... – hmm? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, unfortunately – most people will never even see that. And now one of the things that has been mentioned is if there ever is a chance to carbon date again, maybe they'll go back to the original protocols that we established and therefore give a more favorable um, response to the results. I would expect the results to come in at about 2000 years. Well, and, that's, and I didn't mean to interrupt there, but I was just going to say, I mean, even just Googling a little bit, you know, there's there's plenty of um, plenty of papers and some of them might be, you know, in early phases of, of um, peer review. They may not be certain, you know, there's different theories and stuff out there, but I, I've seen multiple other tests that that use different methods to attempt to date it, which mm -hmm. a lot of people forget about and, and some are newer than others, but uh, in different fields and different sort of disciplines to get an idea. And every one of those I've seen puts it somewhere within a reasonable range of, of Christ's. Uh, yeah, Christ's I, I think and that's so, absolutely correct. One of the things that is forgotten is the first po person who pointed out that this cloth was very, very old, uh, wasn't one of the members of the team at all. She happened to be a textile expert and she came to Ray Rogers, our chemist, 
And she said, there's something called invisible reweaving. Ray Rogers said, you're nuts. I mean, he basically thought she was, you know, out to, out to lunch there. But then she mm-hmm. gave him some information and he decided to do a test. Lo and behold, it was cotton. And since then, they found out some of the materials that were used to dye the cotton. So it looked like the linen. So many right. things like that. And the fact of the matter is, since its known history, its documented history is so clear, and since we have these historical images that date way beyond its documented history, come on, um, mm. you're really clutching at straws to come out and say it's medieval. That's been a really fun sort of rabbit hole I've, I've gone down on a couple of programs with a couple of different guests into some of the theories about um, – specific facial feature marks um well, yes. very very specific marks we go with the byzantine coins and certain the religious right. art you know aspect is a really neat study too <laughs> for sure absolutely i don't know if you've seen it but there's a byzantine coin that has the image of christ pantocrata on it and if you do a a, a matched image of the shroud face with that coin and you size them the same you will see that whoever minted that coin knew the shroud. There's no doubt. Mm. It's a part of my presentation that I do. And, um, and I think if I could turn this into a course, I would love to do that and have it given at colleges or seminaries or whatever, because Mm. the amount of detail um, that we know, that we know for certain is overwhelming. And I always tell people, don't look at one aspect of the shroud. So some guy comes along and says, well, see, I painted this and it looks like a negative. The negative Mm -hmm. is the easiest quality to reproduce since we have cameras. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The shroud was known (laughs) 600 years before the invention of the camera at the very latest. So, oh, but, but it's 3D. And I have never, ever, ever seen a, a... produced image that is 3d like the shroud nothing Mm. that's ever been presented is 3d so look at everything look at the fact that pollen was found yeah look at the fact let's 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 go there let's go down the list here a little because i'm curious what both of you really what what are some of the the real kind of home run things so to speak that uh you know that really jump out at you in particular that that are particularly interesting or, or even astonishing when we were there the, the late Dr. Max Fry, criminologist, botanist, um, used uh, by, I forget the name of that uh, European criminal group, but he's, he is one of their is key Inter- guys. Interpol? Yeah. He okay? often was called in, let's say a murder was committed in France, and they arrested the suspect in London. And, of course, you oh, I was in London. And they call him Max Fry, and he does a vacuum sweep of the guy's clothing and finds <laughs> pollen from France, you know, from the neighborhood mm-hmm. where the murder occurred. That's him. So I mm. got to tell you this story. We're all there. He's one of the few non-American team members allowed in during the testing. And he takes some cellophane tape. And, and he's, you can literally see the shroud <laughs> come up off the platform. And most of us are like, you know, our heart in our throats, that he's going to destroy it. Um, Now, we had Kodak develop a non-pressure applicating $7,000 a roll (laughs) tape, $15,000 applicator. I mean, it cost a fortune back then. And we rolled it onto the shroud, and you never saw the shroud move. Guess who got pollen and who didn't? (laughs) He found pollen from turkey we believe the shroud was in turkey he found pollen from jerusalem and he begins to dictate where these pollens are from one of the most fascinating things to me is that one of the pollens that was identified is only found in the area around jerusalem and Mm. it's only that plant is only pollinating in the month of nisan the month when Christ was crucified. I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Worrell, how about you? Any, anything that uh, 
just really got your attention, you know, right from the get go or something you've learned even more recently that's that's particularly fascinating? Well, the there are quite a few. I, I would say to me personally, I think the the uh, the three dimensionality of the image, if you really understand how that comes about, people think three dimensionality, they tend to think, oh, well, it's because if you take, let's say, a piece of fabric and dip it in paint, or you take a paintbrush and put it on some fabric, you think, oh, well, the paint's going to do what? Soak into the fabric. It'll soak in more in some places soak in less in other places, but with the three-dimensionality of the shroud, all of that information is on only the uppermost fibers of the threads within the shroud. So, in fact, for people who say, oh, it was painted, physiologically impossible. And some of it's just common sense. If you put a liquid paint or any other kind of liquid dye or powder or anything on, on a piece of fabric, a piece of linen, What's it going to do? It's going to soak into the fabric. But right. that simply is not the case with the shroud. That and, uh, you know, as Dr. Stevenson alluded to, the different types of pollen from the different countries and areas that were found on the shroud, uh, that, that was of, of great interest to me as well. Sure. I also well, I want, want to point out, the, the, you mentioned the blood. Oh, yes, go ahead. Briefly, um, it's only superficial let me tell you how superficial it is. If you, it's on the upper curved surface of the fibers themselves. And if you take one of those fibers and snap it, it's white at its core. If we backlight the entire shroud, the image disappears. The blood stains don't. Why? Because they penetrate, right. they soak through. And let me add, wherever there's blood, there's no image which means right. the blood was there first and the blood attenuated whatever the image formation process was. Right. Well, let me ask you this, cause this, this was just something I thought about recently. Um, and, and I don't remember if I read something about it somewhere or not. I think I did, uh, but a particularly interesting thing to me is with the blood stains, as I understand it, there's no, there's no smearing or any indication. Like I've described to students, I said, you know, not getting too graphic, but telling them, you know, when you get, if you get a cut or something or your shirt is over it and, mm -hmm. you know, it sticks to it, you know, and then if you, if you have to pull that off, you know, it, it, it makes a mess and everything that the, there doesn't seem to be any of, of indications of that whatsoever. Meaning this, you can't just say that this was a body wrapped that was unwrapped. And then Correct. the body's taken away real quick for grave robbers because you would see the signs of that on the cloth. Is that is that a fair thing to <laughs> to point that's, out? Or that's absolutely fair. You can also point out that the blood is not as most aged blood would be dark, almost black. The blood still contains a lot of its red coloration. There is something that transpired in that blood that set the color, if you will, and so. Mm -hmm. Again, we have a, a very unique situation. There's also evidence of serum albumin. This man definitely um, went through a horrific, horrific torture uh, to see that evidence in the blood stains. The blood from the, the wound in the side, serous fluid surrounds it. It not only surrounds the side, but it goes around to the back of the image. Blood and serum do not separate in the body until after death. Hmm. Hmm. What does the scripture say? The soldier wanted to be sure he was dead and he put the spear in his side and there came out blood and water, serous fluid. Right. I did hear somewhere too that the, uh, if I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, I know the wounds match uh, on the, the head of yes. the shroud with the, with the sudarium as well. Mm -hmm. um, That's what I've been blood told. Type. But I, and I, I also heard somewhere I want to look into this more. But I, I heard somewhere else that there's also evidence on there of of uh, additional fluids and spit and things like that 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 match as well that you can't see with the naked eye. I I wouldn't be surprised at all. Uh, I'm not an expert on a sudarian. Yeah. Um, men that I respect have done a lot more studies in that area, and do say there's a match. I do know on the shroud there were particles of dirt uh, in the na nasal area and on the feet, mm -hmm. and we would expect that. He fell with no ability to break the fall. The nasal cartilage is separated. Um, there are so right. many things, like there's a bruise. 
that almost has the eye swollen shut. Um, Mm -hmm. One of the things that fascinated me early on is I did uh, look into Jewish burial custom. Gospel Mm -hmm. said Jewish burial custom was followed. Sometimes Christians have the mistaken idea that Jesus was wrapped like a mummy. He wasn't. Mm -hmm. I've heard heard that a lot. I've heard that in the comment threads. It's absolutely not. The linen strip theory is absolutely bogus. Um, Mm. I went to a messianic rabbi by the name of Eliezer Erbach. Turns out he was the founder of what is now Chosen People Ministries. And Mm. I went to him and I said, this is what we have. Some people say it doesn't match Jewish burial custom. He pointed to me how it does match Jewish burial custom. He told me to get a hold of a book called Code of Law. I got Code of Law. Everything I saw in there confirmed that it does match the Jewish burial custom. To postulate that he was wrapped like a mummy and that because of the amount of myrrh and aloes uh, that was used, that that mummy case would set up like a cast. Right, yeah. And that what they saw when they went into this tomb was this um, empty mummy case. Um, Wait a minute. Don't you remember that when Jesus called Lazarus from the tomb, he was able to come forth? Mm -hmm. And I actually heard someone suggest that that was because Jesus levitated his body out of the tomb. Give me a break. How far do you have to go to stretch, you know, unbelief well, and, and Lazarus is in there for for four days uh, yes not, not even through so it's, it, it should be even more firm and set and rigid exactly and, you know, oh. exactly hmm. yeah this is and it's it's there's so many theories and I get into some of that stuff in some of the other uh, interviews like I'm talking I've, I've been talking to Dr. Cheryl White I'm gonna have her back yes. on again too talking about some of the potential evidence to connect up the shroud with the Mendelian. And so we, we get into different, different topics here. Um, but I, I, we have a couple, you know, a couple minutes left here, some good time to mm-hmm. share with both of you. So I, I just thought I'd open it up and see if there's anything else in particular, you know, that you really uh, like to share with people, if anything, for any presentations you give that you, you'd like to spend a little extra time on that really seems to connect with people and help them think this sort of thing through. I've, as I've given this presentation, one of the things that I have developed, it, it didn't come naturally. It came because I kept trying to understand things. And what I learned was that ancient Hebrew is pictographic. Every letter has a picture meaning to it. And the first thing I read along those lines was Barashit in the beginning. And in the beginning, Barashit if you look at the Hebrew letters, it reads, the son of God crushed his hand on a cross. Whoa, Mm -hmm. Uh, sounds to me like Revelation, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Well, let's look a little further. It's Barashit Elohim, Aleph Tav. But the Aleph Tav is not translated in our English Bible. What is Aleph Tav? Behold, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, mm. the Olive Tav. Whoa, yeah. it didn't <laughs> stop there. Then I really started looking. The unpronounceable name, Yod Hey Vav Hey. Behold the hand, behold the nail. Is it getting firm? firm? <laughs> I was about to walk away from the shroud years ago because of the attacks of people like Josh McDowell because my book was written um, because Mm. I got attacked from many different fronts uh, by people that just didn't want to believe they couldn't accept the fact Mm. that this could possibly be Jesus burial cloth. I remember saying that, you know, the, the shroud is not necessarily a part of my faith. I accepted Christ without the shroud. So therefore I don't need it. I'm glad to have seen it, touched it and, and written about it and so forth. And then my wife encouraged me to reread Isaiah 52. Well, you've read Nazah. The word Mm -hmm. Nazah is right there in Isaiah 52. And it means to startle and to sprinkle. Mm -hmm. And the scripture says that they'll see his marred face and his marred body, and it's going to startle and sprinkle them. Kings will shut their mouths 
what had not been told them shall they see. And so I immediately mm-hmm. thought, now, wait a minute. Paul said, King Festus, you know about this. So if it's future kings, it's got to be future to Paul at the very least, because they knew right. about it. Now, where is the picture of his marred face and marred body? And then I went a step further. Uh-huh. What is Nazah? Ancient mm-hmm. Hebrew says, Behold, the heir to the throne pierced. Mm-hmm. Sounds like Zechariah to me. They're going to look on the one they've pierced. Yeah. yeah. And so it's things like yeah. that that I have added over the years to my presentation. I don't just, and, and I mean, I could go on. The purposes of linen in scripture, how linen is used in scripture, and how it matches, the feast days, and how they line up. You start putting all these yeah. things together, and you have too much for coincidence, way too much for right. coincidence. <clears throat> And I'll add one more thing. I had been invited by a classmate of mine and another Air Force Academy graduate from an earlier class. I was invited to Boston to speak at their church. It was wonderful. Um, The earlier grad put me in a beautiful, um, he had like, I don't know what you would call it, like a guest house um, behind his home. And it was there that I discovered what I just mentioned to you about Nazah, that it meant the heir to the throne pierced. And so I had a beautiful meeting there, and I came back home. I wasn't home too long before he wrote me and said, hey, have you seen this book, The Karamayan Lost and Found? Well, I had never heard of The Karamayan. I had heard of The Mandel- mm-hmm. Mandelian, or however you want to pronounce yeah. it. I hadn't heard of The Karamayan. Mandelian, Karamayan, same thing. Image of Edessa, same thing. So I get mm-hmm. the book, and I read it, and this guy who's an amateur archaeologist goes to Turkey and finds what he is convinced is the stone recorded of being where they found the shroud in a niche above the wall after the flood. And he Uh writes a whole book on it. So I write the publisher, Morgan James, and I said, if you did his book, you're going to want my book. And I sent him the copy of Nazar, Morgan James published Nazar. So again, too many coincidences. Who was it? Um, the famous baseball player says, too much coincidence is not a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I got to share this with you because this is so funny. It, it, uh, just today, um, and, and for folks watching this or listening, we had to reschedule this because you know, I just I was sick a few weeks back. So this wasn't even the original day we were going to do this. We were finding different dates that worked for everybody. And um, I had a personal day today. And just shifting things around. I was going to do it last week. I was going to do it today. All these other things that happened to be this morning. And one of them was a visit to um, a friend of mine who's who's a priest. He lives about an hour away. He married my wife and I. I haven't seen him in a long time. And uh, so I go down and meet with him and I'm, I'm leaving. And the main church is is, is closed. It's kind of, they're doing renovations and stuff. Um, I was just on my way out. I said, hey, can I pop in there? He said, well, no, it's locked up. Um, but the old church down the street, uh, they just... They have that open for anyone that wants to go in there. So all of these these just fortuitous things that lead me to go in there. And I walk in, there's there's one gentleman in there, and he's just an older gentleman. He's up there praying. And um, he was actually in the middle, like a phone call had come in right before I came in. And he was alone, so he took it. But as soon as he saw me, he got embarrassed. He finished up, and he's apologizing to me. And I said, oh, no worries. I'm just popping in, and then I'm going to be on the road. And I get ready to leave and he just introduces himself and he says, uh, he says his name. And then he says, I do shroud of Turin talks. That's what I do. I, have you ever, he says, have you ever heard of it? And I just said, this is, you know, like I'm looking at the picture of our Lord. I was like, you have to be kidding me. And so we only talked for 30 seconds, but I just said, you know, this, and I, I go out to the car and I'm just laughing the whole way. I said, okay. <laughs> so so and some people would just laugh at that and say, oh, that's superstition. I was like, well. I don't know. Or is there more to it? You know, <laughs> there is so much more to it. I, I, I'm not giving Brian much time to speak. I, I could tell you no, please, things that please. have happened, but this one really got me about a year ago. I got an email from a lady in London and she shared with me how she had seen verdict on the shroud as a young girl in a bookstore. She ran home broke open her piggy bank, jumped on her bicycle, 
rode back down to the bookstore and bought it. She came back. She read it. She gave her heart to the Lord. Her dad bought her a Bible. And a few years later, she created a website on the Shroud for children. Oh, wow. Now, here's the (laughs) thing about that. I could tell you at least three stories like that that I'm aware of where someone that I would least expect or not even know and I gave a presentation or this or that and boom, God used it. But you Mm -hmm. never know what is going to be the result. I stood in an Mm -hmm. airport waiting to catch a plane back to IBM. Um, Like I said, God gave me flying back after three years. And so I was returning. We had left the corporate jet there. I was returning commercial. But I often took copies of the book with me because I never knew who I was going to meet on the road. So over the years, I gave books to Charlie Pride, Dion Warwick, um, just a number of people (laughs) you would, you know, would go, wow, you did? Yeah, Yeah. I did. Autograph. I'm waiting for this point. I believe as well. Oh, yeah? Oh, wow. I believe Denzel Washington as well. Is that correct? Yeah, Denzel as well. But in this airport, I'm waiting, and there's the late Howard Cosell. And people Mm -hmm. are besieging him. Howard, what about this fight? Howard, what about... And I could tell the poor guy's exhausted, right? And so finally, they call our plane, and so people leave him alone. And we're on the same plane. So I walk up to him, and he kind of gets a little nervous. I said... I'm not going to ask you for anything. I'm going to give you something. (laughs) I autographed a copy of the book and gave it to him. Well, they Mm. called first class first, so he was in. When I came through first class and went back to my nice coach seat, he was clutching that book to his chest like it was the most precious thing he had ever been given. You don't know. (laughs) You have no idea. So Paul Newman had come to shoot a movie at our church and school in New York, and our children went to see him. Um, It was really great. And I brought a copy of the book to him and he asked me why I was doing this with the kids. I said, these children deserve a good education and so on and so forth. But he took that book and he just with with tears in his eyes, he said, you're doing something good. And then I, I don't think it was 45 minutes after he drove off the site that I had a call from Newman's own and he gave the first of several uh, gifts to our ministry. So the point I'm making is you never know how it's going to affect somebody or what it's going to do in their life. We've been privileged to see, to touch, to study what is arguably the most important artifact of all time. And I think we're remiss unless we tell people what we've seen. Hmm. Well said. (laughs) Well, let me just, uh, you know, I want to give you both just the, the, the floor here, just to kind of any, any key takeaways, closing remarks, just advice for anyone listening or watching this, what a, what a good next step might be wherever they're at when it comes to how to pursue this, this question of the shroud. Well, uh, one of the things which we have recently developed is uh, over the past year, Dr. Stevenson and I co-authored a book uh The book is currently available on our website. The title of the book is The Shroud of Turin, Hmm. The Perfect Summary. The entire purpose of the book is to relay much of the information which we shared today with the audience, but relay it in a very, I don't don't want to use this word, Mm -hmm. reader-friendly fashion, if you will. What I mean by that is I want the reader to not assume they have to have a background in chemistry or science or archaeology or history mm-hmm. to understand this. It's written in a very uh, reader accessible manner. Yeah. Uh, yes. Part of it was even written as part of it's even when we talk about the chain of custody, for example, that's even written as kind of a lighthearted fairy tale. But I it's like a very that. One. So <laughs> when people read yeah. that, they would, yeah, they would read it and yeah. say, oh, this is funny. They would read it and say, oh, right. I get it. This just makes sense. So uh, I would yeah. hardly encourage everyone to visit our website, which is www the shroud of turin turin is spelled t-u-r-i-n dot o-r-g that's www.theshroudofturin.org. dot o-r-g in addition the book which we authored we determined <clears throat> we would just want to get this into the hands of as many people as possible we have already translated the book into four languages the book is available in english in hebrew 
in Italian hmm. and in Spanish. All of those versions are available and you can get your free copy at our website, www.theshroudofturin.org slash free book, F-R-E-E-B-O-O. And I'll have those I links below and everything. So yep, absolutely. I think it's very important Excellent. that uh, people begin to see the evidence. And what I mean by that is even in a book, you get fifth, sixth, seventh generation images. It's not the same. It's one of the reasons mm -hmm. why I speak all over the place. If I get invited, I'm going to go and speak. And so I do make myself available to give presentations. Dr. Bryan is, is preparing to start giving presentations as well. Um, we do right. want to get this book around the world. Right now it's in 51 countries, but that leaves us what? about 140 more to go or whatever the current <laughs> count is. Uh, we also have four states to go. Come on, guys. <laughs> um, which which ones, if you don't mind me asking? The Dakotas, Vermont, North Dakota. New Hampshire, okay. and Vermont. Yeah. Okay. They're both Dakotas. So if you guys probably know anybody got in those viewers areas, out there somewhere. Get it. Get it. I'm sure. Yep. It'll change your life. I yep. promise you it'll change your life. There's a lot of great information there. And I just, I, I can't thank you both enough so much for, you know, sharing your time here and all the rescheduling we had to do. It's, it's just been a, a, an honor and a blessing to talk to both of you and, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> thank you. For, thanks for having Thanks us. for having us aboard. Yeah. That was truly my honor, a tremendous delight to speak with both these gentlemen and a lot of food for thought, a lot of really interesting things to take into consideration. As always, with anything we talk about with the Shroud, I just want to you know, reemphasize here again that it's, it's you know, no surprise to anyone who's seen this channel before that, in my personal opinion, I really do believe, as uh, I, I think Father uh, Andrew Dalton has put it really well lately, that uh, to think of the Shroud as perhaps this um, artifact that bears what you could call physical evidence, physical uh, residual effects of a supernatural event. I, I personally believe that, it's, that it is the burial shroud of Jesus and that Jesus's resurrection is what produced the image and that the other uh, tangible physical um, things that we see on the shroud, like the blood and the pollens and all those kinds of things, all serve uh, for a deeper meditation on the sufferings of Christ and the great joy of the resurrection. But granted, a lot of our viewers, a lot of our listeners might have a different opinion, might have a different view, and there is a lot of debate. And so I always encourage that. I, I uh, encourage you to uh, leave comments below, but also feel free to reach out to me through my website if you want, thegraciousguest.org. You can contact me directly that way. And uh, sometimes comments are just too long and I can't get to all of them on there. Um, once in a while, comments are, are uh, not really <laughs> uh, productive or friendly, you know, that sort of thing. I might have to deal with those, but, but by and large, I've been very, very thankful and very blessed, uh, that these conversations that a lot of these interviews have generated, uh, have, have led to some fruit. And I really enjoy speaking with all of you as, as best I can, uh, though it is difficult to get to everybody on there. So feel free to leave a comment below. Uh, like I said, visit the my website, if you want to contact me uh, directly or, or get more information, more resources for all the things we do here on the gracious guest. So, uh, and definitely check out all of those links below for sure to all of the work that Dr. Stevenson and Dr. Worrell are doing when it comes to the shroud. God bless you all. Thank you for stopping by. Subscribe, share this far and wide, like all this content, help me get this, uh, this channel spreading as much as we can and growing. And until next time, don't forget to wonder. Take care. <laughs>